Bienvenue dans la présentation Designing a Scalable Data Platform based on Apache Spark and Iceberg. Je suis heureux d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui pour cette conférence. So, enough of my bad French. We have a packed session, so let's just get started. But first of all, we have to introduce ourselves. Stephen, would you like to start? Sure. So, good morning, everyone. Great seeing you here. I'm Steven, I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS, working with retail customers and having data analytics as an area of depth. Yeah, my name is Norman, I'm a solutions architect at AWS as well. I primarily work with AWS customers in the retail industry in Germany, all of whom use data to run and optimize their business and are running a data platform at a certain maturity stage and scale. So, as we have them in the session title, let's talk about icebergs. For me, icebergs are breathtaking natural wonders. These massive frozen structures sticking out of the water possess beauty and fascination. And you know, Norman, what I think is equally impressive is what you can do with modern IT. Just think about personalization. How can it be that where you listen to music, the, Shopee, uh, the uh, Spotify's, the YouTube's, how can it be that they recommend you the Max Spex song very much accurately based on what you used to listen to? Think about generative AI. How can it be that text is created, um, leads to a super great image generated from it? Just think about real-time logistics optimization. You order in the evening, and the next day you already get the parcel at home. All of that would not work without proper data. But in fact, there's also many more other use cases that work equally impressive as well. Just to name a few, clickstream analytics, fraud detection, we see a lot of them. But in fact, they are just the tip of the iceberg. Beneath the surface, all of these use cases have one thing in common. They rely and depend on properly curated and managed data. Data that makes these use cases possible. But this brings a whole set of new capabilities which are required with an organization on top of those required to actually build the use cases, like data management practices, knowledge about data tools and technology, and data architecture best practices. And Norman, there's one more thing that we need to have in mind, which is the sheer growth of data volume. Just have a look at that. 90% of today's data was just created in the last two years, and much more is to come. And as we know, data volume has a direct impact on the cost of a data platform from architecture perspective, but also process perspective, right? And as we engineer a data platform, we need to have the ability to adapt ourselves and the platform to this almost every three or four years. We need to get, really get this ability. It's no more about designing a data platform which shall last for 10 years. So to get the beautiful glittering above the surface that everybody wants, we have to get the heavy, sometimes dark stuff below the surface right as well. However, this is where frequently things get off track already. But keeping you on track is our mission today. We will start with a history of data platform architectures in the past 20 years, connecting the dots for you and outlining which generation had which capabilities and which challenges. And in part two, we will then give you the ingredients to develop a blueprint for building or modernizing a data platform, which is based on our experience from startup to enterprise customers and which could cover at least 80% of use cases out there. And along the way, we will give you five design principles together with five technical learnings which, you, which could guide you and help you on your day-to-day -day data adventures. So, when I joined the industry, the data platform architecture typically looked like this. We had data sources, which were typically transactional databases from ERP systems or warehouse management systems. And we had ETL processes, which are pieces of code which extract the data from these sources, transform it to make it fit, and load it into a central data warehouse. And these processes typically run once a night, and we're ingesting data in batches into the data warehouse. And then, on top, we had our analytical data users, like Jake from Sales, 
or Alice from finance looking at aggregated data through reports and dashboards. And the stack was typically built on a commercial integrated data warehouse solution, which was at that time heavily expensive, so only big enterprises were able to afford it, because we had to have proprietary licenses, we had to have high-end server hardware, etc., etc. The scalability of these systems was limited. Yes, you were able to have multiple application servers, but adding or removing capacity was a big operational overhead, so that these systems were typically designed for peak load. And the question we have to ask is, were our data users happy with the systems from these times? And the answer is no. <laughs> Typically not, because the time to insight was way too slow. Um, when a business user needed a change to a dashboard or to, uh, to a data pipeline, this was all done by the central data warehouse team, and they were doing three to four releases maximum a year. So the team quickly became the bottleneck. In the upcoming years, several trends came in which changed the landscape. Internet-based companies grew, and the data sources, digital data sources, kicked off. So, like we had an exponential growth of um, of semi-structured data and unstructured data coming from social media or from sensor data. And now, the data sets did not fit into a single machine anymore, and the relational database management systems from the data warehouses were not able to keep up with that anymore. And this challenge, or this was the time when the industry coined the term big data, which finally led to the data lake architecture. And out of that, we had some paradigm shifts that we're, we are going into now. So to handle the large volumes of data, we developed distributed file systems and the corresponding distributed processing engines on top, like MapReduce. And due to the success of open, early open source projects like Linux, um, a new, more open source-backed ecosystem arose like the Hadoop uh, ecosystem. And in terms of hardware, the economical part of the equation switched from those high-end servers to more commodity servers, and we were now building um, our systems to horizontally scale instead of vertically scale. So just adding capacity in terms of storage or I.O. by adding more service. And this came also with the nice side effects that our systems became more highly available and, because, and more durable because the data got distributed over multiple systems. Yeah. And to accommodate this new variety and this new velocity requirements, and due to the cheaper storage we had now, the operating model of the data platform also changed as well. In the data warehouse, this was a very exclusive club. Only data that was in a certain, very specifically narrow shape was allowed to come in. So all visitors needed to fit rigorous standards. It was very exclusive. And in the data lake, we now switch to a paradigm where any data was allowed to come in. There was no dress code, it was able to be out of shape, and it did not have to follow any standards. And this is good for new data users like Barbara from Data Science doing machine learning. She works on unaggregated raw data, and having the schema free access to the data gives her the freedom she needs to do her work. But Jake from Sales and Alice from finance are not happy anymore. They can't use the data lake to do their work properly. As always in software designs, there are trade-offs. And the trade-off here was that while the data lake excelled at storing large volumes of data, we lost the query optimization and performance capabilities of data warehouses. And as on the data lake we can only write whole files, we lack also the in-place updates to insert or delete or update single rows on a table. And we also gave up our asset transactions that we were used from the data warehouse. So for the analytics users, the data lake 
became a data consistency nightmare with an unknown schema and quality guarantees. They wanted to keep their data warehouse. So in the end, we ended with an architecture like this. The data lake was only a complementary architecture, and for structured data workloads, we introduced another set of ETL pipelines, which were bringing the data from the data lake into the data warehouse to fit the needs of the other users as well. And these challenges then paved the way for cloud data warehouses and transactional data lakes. The cloud data warehouses address the downsides of the traditional data warehouses by being more cost effective and over overcoming the scalability limitations, whereas the transactional data lake aims to combine the best of data lakes and data warehouses in one single system. So they still follow the data lake approach by storing data as binary objects in object stores like Amazon S3 or on a distributed file systems. However, for structured data, we add the newly developed open table formats like Apache Iceberg um, into the game, which bring back the transactional and data integrity capabilities we were used from the data warehouse. So, and those table formats also enable us to bring back the query optimization techniques we were used from data warehouses as well, so data users can directly access the data lake um, as well. And for in terms of the open tables formats, we will learn a lot more during the course of the presentation. And finally, also the cloud data warehouses got new capabilities so that they can directly access data stored on the data lake, removing the need for an additional ETL pipelines. So problems we, we had over time were technically addressed but we got more and more tools in our tool belts to solve our data challenges. And now we have a zoo of tools and still many organizations don't get the insights they needed with this zoo of tools. And also we know with a zoo of tools, we typically have more problems um, because now we have to answer questions like, okay, where to get started, which tools to choose, what is each tool capable of, and how do I integrate all those tools? And that's what we want to do today. We want to put the burden of choosing away from you and connect the dots for you. And for that, I hand over to Stephen again. So, thanks, Norman. So then learn from the past and do it better in the future by designing a proper data platform. So first of all, um, I have a quick question to you. How many of you do know Apache Spark? So, oh, yes, oh, more. <laughs> great, great. But for those who still don't know, maybe a very quick, uh, quick primer on Apache Spark. So it's an open source project um, uh, and or originally originated from the University of Berkeley in California. And Spark is, in essence, an in-memory computing engine. And it's somewhat the de facto standard for big data processing and data engineering. Spark is great because it's very versatile. As we will see, you can use it for batch, as well as for streaming use cases, and it is widely supported in the ecosystem, in the Java world, in the Scala world, in the Python world. You have integrations with many, many tools and frameworks. As it is a distributed system, obviously there are multiple components to it. Simplified, it looks as shown on the right-hand side. You have a driver component which takes your job, analyzes your job, and then tries to submit it in distributed parallel tasks to, on one-to-many worker components. As a developer, because I guess many of you are data engineers or developers, you might say, yeah, but how do I interact with Spark as I want to transform data, load data, write data some to somewhere? And for this, in Spark, I write a, a Spark job, obviously. Here we have shown it in Python. So in a, the anatomy of a Spark job pretty much looks like this. You instantiate your Spark session through which your job has access to the uh, interact with the cluster. You can set certain global configuration variables and then somewhat connect to the driver component. Then you typically start off saying Spark read. You read from some source system. It could be a table on a data lake, as we have shown here in this example. We are here reading the orders table. You might um, read from a relational database or whatever sources you have. Then you have the code to transform the data right after. You see in this um, fluid style how you can do this. Here in the example, we are selecting a certain 
selecting two columns, category and amount, and then running some transformation on it, running an aggregation, a sum method, and grouping it by a certain column. And eventually, rewrite it to somewhere. I mean, it is super simplified in essence, but this is how a Spark job could you look like. As you have developed it, you submit it to the cluster, to the driver, and the driver will make sure that it's properly executed. So, but now with that, how we would, would we start designing a data platform? And the first chapter we'll be tackling is batch analytics. So batch analytics means once in a while, once in a night, once in a week, we process large amounts of data to do some analysis. Most common use case is some historic analysis. We want to compare sales month over month, year over year. So the question is now, how do we build a data platform that properly cater, can cater for batch analytics based on Spark and obviously on Apache Iceberg? And for this, the first guiding principle we have at hand for you is to have a mental framework. When designing a data platform, it's really not about tool shopping. This is the worst thing that you can do. Just finding tools that you can plug so together somehow, it's really not about that. It's really to have a mental framework. What are actually the capabilities a data platform that the data platform should have? And then deliberately, based on your requirements, fill those, uh, 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 those various layers. In a simplified way, at least my or our mental model, data platform looks like this. It has an ingestion part, it has a transformation and obviously storage part, it has a serving part, and then it has some cross-functional orchestration and metadata management parts. So this is the guiding framework we have, and now the question is, how, what do we put in there? So this is the what, what we want to build. The question is now, how do we fill it? What's, what's the how? And this leads us directly to our second principle, work backwards from the use cases. What do I mean by that? So we, on the right hand side, we have again our data analyst, Jake. Assuming Jake works uh, in the sales uh, department and is responsible for conducting sales analysts. How has my company's revenue developed this month compared to the previous months? This is Jake's task. This is what he needs to solve. What does he need to start with? First, he needs to obviously have a component on the serving side which provides access to the data. Then, of course, data needs to be stored somewhere, needs to have been transformed, by, and obviously, for in the first place, needs to be, has, has to be ingested. And the idea is then to say, OK, by working backwards from the needs of the persona, we fill the boxes one by one. Let's get a bit more practical. Obviously, the data analyst at first would need to do some thing we call exploratory data analysis. At first, we have data extracted from our CIM system, from our sales system, whatnot. We need to understand the patterns in the data to find the right data set for my use case. So it's a highly interactive, repetitive uh, experience that we need. And for this, already here, you can use Spark. Because you can use Spark in your Jupyter notebooks to, with Spark SQL, as we see later, do the, exactly this type of exploratory analysis to figure out what is the actual queries and what is the data sets that I need later to serve at scale. Well, next, as you figured out, OK, to answer a certain analytical question, I know what the queries are. The question is now, how do I serve at scale data to a dashboard or to a report? For this, we think you need to add a bit more to the game. For this, you very much need a query engine that is capable of highly in highly in parallel serve queries at a low latency. For this, we think adding Trino to the game is a good fit. Trino is a distributed computing, uh, distributed query engine derived from the Presto project. For those, I think most of you or many of you might, might uh, have already heard about it before. But obviously, those two guys need data. We are here in the data lake space, designing a data platform based on the data lake, so we need to fill the storage layer. And here, the one of the first questions we need to answer is, what is the storage format? And the learning here is also to be very deliberate on our needs. What is the spectrum of, pos of possibilities for the storage format? We have the common file formats, like CSV, JSON, XML. We have so-called columnar file formats, like Parquet, which store data on disk um, in terms of the blocks on disk, column by column, whereas others might do it row by row. 
This plays a role. We will see this in a second. And the last one are the so-called table formats or transactional data, uh, data formats like Apache Iceberg and Apache Hoodie, which do one cool thing, which provide an API to a file as it would be a table. You know, with the parquet and with the X JSON XML, we read entire files. This is our I.O. type of mode. With a table format, we act interact it as it would be a table. I select a certain row or a bunch of rows. But now, how to drill it down? In analytics, very much we see one pattern, and it is that we query a few columns only. In particular, aggregative queries, you typically do an aggregative operation like a sum or a count distinct on just a few columns of your data set, or not all. And this means, actually, in order to be really efficient, I don't want to read all of the other data, because all of the other columns. I need to have a file format which is efficient for exactly this purpose. And this strikes through the left-hand side the common file formats, because they are uh, on disk. Um, the layout is row-orientated row and not column-orientated. We would read a lot of data which we actually don't need. So we stick with the columnar formats and tile for, uh, table formats. How do we narrow it down further? And there's one thing that for a while maybe was a bit lost in the big data space, but was actually always important in uh, database systems analytics, and this is the ability to have asset. You know, the ability in one consistent transaction, m modify a table, insert rows, update rows, merge rows. We always, always wanted that. And it's equally important for uh, our personas on a data platform, analyst and engineer, because I really want to be able, as I read data, to read a consistent snapshot and not want to have a separate operation, you know, um, running in the same time and giving me an inconsistent view on the data. And if we if we look on the columnar formats in its pure form and in the common file formats with JSON, XML, and so forth, this is not feasible. Because here we replace entire files, and if I replace an entire file at once, how can I ensure that a parallel read operation consistently reads data? And this leaves op uh, as the remaining option the table formats because they give us exactly this asset, comp uh, asset abilities. So Iceberg, for those who don't know, a prime, a primer is a transactional data format, which is comprised of a data layer and a metadata layer. The data files are, you have not just one, but many, and each transaction to your uh, table creates new files on the storage. You know, each time I read insert, uh, in, uh, insert, update, or delete data, it would create a new record. So I have a series of files, and the metadata layer on top, which are metadata files, give us the instruction how to read the data files in the proper order. How does Apache Iceberg work a bit more on a technical level? So assuming we have a query engine and we want to interact with the Iceberg table, which sits somewhere on our data lake. So our query engine would first go to, the, to a data catalog. In the Iceberg world, we say Iceberg catalog to find what is the current metadata pointer. And then to work, what we see on the right-hand side, work through the metadata tree. So Iceberg is based on a metadata tree. The query engine would work itself to the, through the metadata tree to eventually find what is the most recent data files I need to read. And it's usually not one that's to be read, but multiple ones, and in which order, and in which order to blend those data files together to get a consistent view on the data. And we have last comment, as you see, those multiple data files. And this is just, again, because of the effect that each and every transaction to the table creates new files, which just capture the delta to the previous state. With that, we make the decision to make our storage layer based on Apache Iceberg. But next, you would say, first, we need to next, we get data in there. So we need to get somehow the ingestion and transformation components filled and equip our data engineer with proper tools. In the data platform we will be desi designing, we go again with Apache Spark, because it gives us already everything we need to do these jobs, to read the data for our batch analytics, transform it, and store it eventually on the storage layer. And Spark is really great to doing the data ingestion, because through its pl uh, pluggable connectors, you can really write efficient code, changing data sources with very smooth uh, change, uh, changes to your code. 
On the left-hand side, you see a short example reading via JDBC from a relational database, right? We first connect to the database, um, provide certain credentials we need, and then do our transformation. On the right-hand side, we say, see another example reading from a CSV file. But you see the difference are quite marginal. So Spark is great in the sense that changing data sources and also uh, data things just require a very few changes to your code and gives us, a data, as a data engineer, a very consistent experience. So Spark is really good in um, providing consistent um, experience for various data sources and transformation types. But another learning we make with our customers all day is that in the data space, as, as hard as it is as a developer possibly, it's not about just Scala, Python, or Java. In data analytics space, people want SQL as well. And we want, uh, when we want to design a data platform that is widely accepted, we need to have a solution for SQL as well. Just imagine um, the people that are originating from the classic business intelligence space, most of them would know SQL very well. So how do we build a platform that also caters for their needs and does not frustrate them with some higher level programming language? And again here, surprise, surprise, Spark is great again because it has a SQL interface. So as you can see here on the right hand side, you can, uh, with the spark.sql um, uh, method, we can run SQL statements to select or transform data on our data sets. So meaning we don't need another technology for SQL-based uh, transformations for people who want to do SQL. No, we can go with Spark as well. So obviously, now we fill that. We have the ingestion components done, the transformation and storage. But I might ask the question, Norman, how do we actually then find the data we need? Yeah, and that's exactly the thing we will look at now. But first, remember the paradigm shift we had with the data lake I introduced earlier. So any data was allowed to enter the data lake and there was no dress code. So when we are entering the data lake club, how would it look inside? Ideally a bit like this. But in many cases, it looked more like this and the data lake became a data swamp. And the reasons for that are that for the data lake consumers, so far it is hard to know what is in the data lake, so we have a lack of data discoverability, and we don't know what quality each data set has. And this brings us to our next design principle. And the design principle is to have a layered data architecture. Um, when what this means is that we want to set clear expectations um, we have to each data set in terms of data quality. So we divide our data lake storage layer into buckets for specific use cases. So typically each company defines the rules uh, for itself, but as a general best practice, we have the following three buckets. So the first bucket is to have raw data. So that's where we have data sets that are in the format as they were emitted by the source system. Typically no quality checks are applied and really minimal to no transformation was done. Then second, we have the standardized layer. And in this layer we have cleaned the data, we already did apply certain quality insurance rules, and we converted the data sets into a file format for long-term storage. And then as the last bucket, we have the curated data sets. That's where we have data sets which are already optimized for a very specific use case where we potentially join together multiple data sets or store the data into a denormalized format which better fits the use case. And this caters for first an efficient long-term usage and second an short-term access depending on the user's requirements. So while we have a better overview over the data quality of the data sets now, we still don't know yet which data we have inside our data lake. And to get, to get that, we need to properly maintain metadata about each data set as well. And along the ingestion and processing paths for every data set, there are three aspects uh, which need to be covered. 
The first one is the table metadata registered in the technical data catalog. We already heard when we were going through the, the iceberg layer, like a Hive Meta Store or the AWS Glue data catalog. So the technical data catalog on the data platform is now the counterpart to the information schema of, a, for example, a data, um, relational database management system. This is where we register the table. This is where we store which columns are there and which data types each column has. And the second metadata layer which is needed is the lineage data. Data lineage is a bit like tracing and observability. So we keep records of when and from where the data entered the data platform, how it was transformed and combined with other data sources. So doing this, we create trustworthiness in the origin of the data and we get an audit trail so that we can assess which potentially downstream data sets are affected if we find a bug or an error in our data. And with open lineage, um, we have the, the counterpart to um, open observability, uh, to open telemetry and observability. It's a standardized format on how to emit lineage data to various um, data lineage backend systems. And the third one are data quality checks. So we want to have information which data quality rules were applied to a certain data set so that the user really exactly knows which data quality and which guarantees he can expect. And doing this manually so quickly becomes unfeasible that the only thing to keep up with that is to automate that process. And now I would like to give you a, just a rough idea on how this would look in a Spark job. So during initiating our Spark session, we are telling Spark to which data catalog to look at and where the data catalog is located. So it's a bit like connecting to the database. Then we can define a schema for a new table. And finally, with the data frame API of Spark, we can create that table and it will write back to the data, uh, to the data catalog and register it there. And for lineage data, it would be very similar. We would have a plugin we can hook into the configuration of our Spark session, and then the due to hook Spark will automatically emit the data to the data lineage system along the processing of the job. As we have added the metadata layer, we reach the next stage of our data platform. Basically, we have an end-to-end -end pass now from the source to the consumer. So we have to ask the question, okay, what can go wrong in our data platform now? Where can we still run into problems? And the answer is our data volumes can grow and this will impact the query performance of our data sets. So a typical problem would be the following. Assume an orders table where we are storing orders and every order has a category. And as we ingested data over time, on our data lake for the table, we will have certain data files and the individual rows for the categories are spread over all these files. Now, assume we're doing a query which has a WHERE clause that filters for a specific category. And to answer this query, the query engine would have to really scan all data files of the table. And as this could be thousands or hundreds of thousands of files, at some point in time, this gets very inefficient. And we are not only losing uh, query runtime, but we are also burning money. And the first thing we can do here is that we can introduce partitioning. So when we are creating the table, we are telling our engines that this data should be partitioned by a certain column, and typically a column that we most frequently filter on in our queries. And the effect of this is that upon ingestion, that, the, that we will only produce data files that only contain rows of a certain category. And if we would run the same query again now, from the metadata and this kind of 
pre-sorting the data, our query engine would exactly to know which files can be skipped, which would bring us back a certain level of performance and reduce the runtime. There are more advanced techniques like that and a, a certain set of problems that, but for that, for today, this is what we wanted to give you. And now I hand over to Steven again to cover a different set of use cases. Yeah, let's get up to speed now and move over to streaming analytics. So if you think back of the use cases that we initially mentioned right in the intro of the presentation, for many of them, we would need what we call streaming analytics. And what is it about? Streaming analytics means we are no more in batch reading big, large tables, big data files, and processing them you know, in a hour, um, minutes to hours or even longer taking process once in a night or so. But no, what we do, we continuously pro uh, process data as it is being created. And we need this, for instance, if we stay again in the sales domain, if we want to, for instance, realize ne near real-time dashboards. So you imagine your company is into the year-end sales events, has some special promotion and campaign running, and the product managers or sales managers are saying, hey, so far so good, our sales campaign is running since this morning. What is actually the actuals in the past two hours? What is the actuals in the past half an hour? To get this accuracy or this freshness of data, we need to process data as it is being created, and this is what we refer to as stream processing. Finally, here, as an architect, I find myself also often here, could be trapped yet to go now, what is the coolest tool around the block that I need to have here? Streaming, cool thing, now, now really get the best what we need. And not caring what we already have. And this is really the trap that you as an architect could make, right? You want to actually, but actually your job is it to ensure that you stay what we have here on the right side, the easy solution, but because of many interests, you could easily move to the left side here, the hard solution. So we say, really, also here as an architect, finally, if you come to this point, really keep it simple and short and try to stay with fewer tools the uh, 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 as possible. You know, the fewer tools, the better. And that's why we see, say, start, if you already have a data platform based on Spark for batch transformation, batch analytics, use it for streaming as well. I mean, I don't know um, if you, uh, how many know, but in Spark already has a second generation of stream processing called Spark Structured Streaming, which possibly gives us already all at hand what we need. So Spark Structured Streaming, what is it? Actually, is it's the extension of the existing Spark programming model on streams. Pretty much same um, or same or similar programming model, same data frame API we always know. How does it work? You know, we have, if you think about your Spark job and the transformation steps, what you had, in the Spark stream, uh, structured streaming world, what happens is that you repetitively execute them as so-called micro-batches on your stream. So this, let's assume this is your stream. It could be Kafka, it could be kin Kinesis, or whatever you have. And Spark streaming does say, let's take the first item, the first uh, record out of it, process it as a micro-batch. Take the next one out, play the same uh, transformations again, process it. Take the next one out and do this every two seconds, every five seconds, you can configure this, but this is in essence how Spark Structured Streaming works. And what is great about it is if you wanna, if you are someone who wants to easily conquer technology, it is that it's very easy or relatively easy to move as a Spark batch developer to a Spark Streaming developer. Let's have a look on this example here. The left-hand side is the Spark batch world. The right-hand side is the streaming world. There's just a few, I mean, the code looks very similar, right? There's just a few differences. Instead of a read, I will have a read stream. Instead of a write, I have a write stream. Obviously, I need to have some other configuration parameters, like, for instance, to which Kafka broker to connect, to which topic to connect, if I connect with Kafka. But pretty much what, what, uh, what we want to give you at hand is, that with Spark streaming, you have a relatively lo low learning uh, or flat landing curve for your engineers if you want to introduce Spark, uh, if you want to introduce streaming to a data platform that is already based on Spark. So it's really great because you have a consistent programming model, same, um, sim same or similar APIs, same and consistent feeling as a developer. 
But if we bring together in the streaming world transactional data formats where, as I said, each and every transaction creates a new file, you know, I insert a record, new file, I insert another file, hey, re record, new file, I end up with such a situation. Many, la uh, many small files, bytes, kilobytes range, 100,000 of that. Just spoke to a customer last week which said it had like two millions in the range of millions of files. And this is bad because it can create a performance risk at scale. Imagine as your query engine wants to interact with your data set, it reads and opens all of those small files. So a lot of I.O. in there because we need to read and open every of those small files. And this is something we really want to avoid in analytics. Solution to that, learning, might sound obvious, but many don't know, is to do the compaction. Think of your housekeeping and think of something that is called compaction. Compaction means we compact small files, many small files, in fewer larger files. Megabyte, maybe gigabyte, it depends on the profile of your storage and query engine. Typically, they have so there's some preferences in which ranges your files should be to have the best performance. But in essence, it's about compressing, or not compressing, collapsing small files into larger uh, big files. And the great thing about Apache Iceberg in combination with Spark is that Apache Iceberg gives us already out of the box all what we need to do the compaction with Spark. You see this here in this code sample, a Spark SQL again, where we invoke a system method called rewrite data files. This comes from the Iceberg library for Spark, and through this method, we can make the Spark engine compact our iceberg table, here in this case, orders table, into larger files. We have specified, you see this at the bottom, as a target file size of one gigabyte. As we run this, and we can do this, by the way, in the background, we can continuously uh, continue to do the batch analytics or even streaming analytics in the background, we can do the compaction or in parallel, right? And we collapse the small files till we reach one gigabyte and then move on to the next larger file. And it's really crucial at scale to keep the performance and avoid the risk of getting performance degradation of small files. And again, I mean, we've seen many customers, even advanced customers, who are not always the best here. So with that, I hope we are in consensus here. We have also filled now the last part on the ingestion side, the streaming ingestion side with Spark as well. But the question means, uh, remains, how do we actually orchestrate that? Also, the compaction jobs, I mean, who invokes them? Who invokes them at the right time? We need to have a component hand hand. Also, the batch jobs. And that's why we want to fill now the management and metadata uh, layer on top. And here, to be very uh, short, we think Apache Airflow staying in the open source wor world could be a good solution. Apache Airflow is a uh, data pipeline orchestrator. So if you are more familiar with, um, yeah, um, CI CD, it could be the equivalent to your Jenkins or other build server, where you have, instead of a build pipeline, you have a data pipeline which you orchestrate. But now, what happens if our business is successful, continues, more and more analytical use cases are being deployed to our Spark data platform? What happens? And one thing we need to remember ultimately, Spark is nothing else than a system that runs somewhere on a VM or a computer which has finite memory, which has finite storage, finite resources. And over time, right, <laughs> sounds obvious, but we find ourselves more and more being um, required to deal with capacity management, adding new storage, updating our, our system libraries. The more use cases we have, the more data and demand we have, the more and more we need to look into this. And again, but if this is the trend, we know that data will be more and more important in the future, right? If this is the trend, we need to ask ourselves as a data architect one question. Where do we want to spend time? On system maintenance or on building cool stuff? Do we want to juggle resources or do we have time to build the clickstream analytics, the fraud detection, the real-time fraud detection that really differentiates us from our competitors, from the other companies we are, work, are working um, on the market with. And this is the last principle that we think that we should, as an architect, have in mind is to delegate undifferentiated tasks. 
do you want to manage Spark software stack, Spark libraries, system libraries, all the CVEs, the log4js that come at the, right at the time that you don't want them, or do you want to have us manage Spark runtime which does this for you? Compute capacity is the same. What if we would have an engine which automatically deploys new resources, VMs, and removes them according to the spikes in our workload? Would be a great thing to have, no? Housekeeping, the compaction, and there's other stuff like vacuuming or creating uh, fresh statistics on our tables. What if we would have a data catalog which does this inbuilt for you, uh, for us? And we're no even more requiring to uh, invoke some system functions to do that. And lastly, storage. I mean, it's a given. I, I, I decided no more wanting to manage storage capacity at a certain point in my career, right? And we think um, the cloud, like AWS, gives, us, gives you all you need to accomplish this. And for this, we have as a last uh, diagram in the session an example how you could build a modern data stack on AWS. For Spark part, we have Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which you can perceive as a managed uh, engine or managed service for running Apache Spark. You have S3 as the storage layer where we have our data lake and have our, all our iceberg tables. We have the Glue Data Catalog, which is uh, high uh, Metastore compliant, where we can track our iceberg tables and do the housekeeping of them. We orchestrate everything with Amazon Managed Workflows for Apache Airflow, and at the bottom right, if we need it, we have Amazon Athena as a Trino-based um, query engine. With that, Norman. Yeah. As we are approaching the end of the task, let's briefly recap what are the three things you should take away if you walk out of the session today. And the first thing we would like you to remember is don't do tool shopping. Work backwards from the use cases of your data analytics users. The second one, think about data governance already from the start and not in hindsight and do it automated to avoid the data swamp. And the third one, Spark and Iceberg can together solve a lot of batch and streaming use cases out there. This is it for today. Now I have one final ask for you. You might know AWS is a feedback-driven company, so please take three minutes now and fill out the survey feedback. Thank you, and then we are open for questions. Uh, you chose uh, Iceberg, but have you considered Delta Lake? Yes. And uh, what comparison did you do? How did you choose? Can you please repeat? I didn't get it you acoustically. You chose to go with Apache Iceberg, yes. but uh, my understanding is that uh, Spark often works with Delta Lake as well, Delta Tables. So have you considered that? Apache Iceberg has a, is a very emergent technology. Wide range, many companies, many vendors um, choosing it, and it has advanced capabilities like, for instance, something we have not shown, um, partition evolution, time travel. This is great stuff. That's why we choose Apache Iceberg. So there are, as you said, there are several table formats out there, and we see Apache Iceberg as the one that is really getting traction in all ecosystems. So we see it as the one that will, let's say, really keeps the data you have open and having it accessible from various engines only beyond, even beyond Spark. So if you have really the zoo of tools, um, there is a, a pretty good chance that, uh, let's say, more of the other engines you're using are also able to access the data table if it's in the iceberg format. Uh, first, thanks for this amazing presentation. Uh, I've got two questions. The first one about the transformation step for the uh, different jobs. Uh, does uh, Apache Spark support the failure, like the on-job failure uh, process, similar in uh, Spring Batch? And the second question is about uh, computing and auto-scaling. Does this solution uh, fits into the container-based environment if you are working in uh, cloud native world fully everything in, on Kubernetes, for, exa for example, does it fit uh, in this environment or not? Thank you. 
Uh, yes, it does fit into the environment. So um, I can only speak for the AWS service. So AWS EMR has two operating modes. The first one is to, let's say, run your worker nodes on virtual machines, which is on AWS uh, EC2. But you also have the possibility to run your worker nodes on a Kubernetes cluster in AWS EKS. And the first question was about failure during stream processing. You know, you can have the so in the Spark streaming job, you can capture where you, the offset where you stop processing and then continue, for instance, in failure case from this offset. And there's checkpointing also to know where do, where do we stand. Yeah, so we get the signals that we are over time. So if you have further questions, we will still be around outside after the session. So feel free to come us and talk to us. <laughs>